I find it hard to trust parents of estranged children. I have no idea what I've done wrong. This is the way it always starts. Then it's often followed by assertions, they did everything for their children. As they try desperately to convince me they are the victim, I can't help but feel that the person they are really trying to convince is themselves. As an estranged child, it's hard for me to have these conversations. These parents say many of the things my parents say. I'm sure my mother and father are out there somewhere, insisting they have no idea what they've done wrong. But the truth is, many of these parents do know what they did wrong. Firstly, because they were there. They know very well what they have done because they were the ones doing it. And secondly, we tell them as adults in a desperate bid to make them see the error of their ways so we can save the relationship. I told my mother many times how she affected me. Each time, I naively hoped she would listen to me and say sorry. All I wanted was for her to acknowledge the years of psychological abuse and admit it was her fault so I could stop blaming myself. But she refused to take responsibility. So one day I cut ties and she had the audacity to act as if it came out of nowhere. I begged my father many times to believe me over my mother. After what felt like the 100th time, I cut ties for the sake of my mental health. He insists he has no idea why I don't talk to him. My parents know the truth, but they don't want to face it. Telling stories to other people, where they paint themselves as the victims is more comforting. And those people lap it up and feel sorry for them. I understand parents and children fall out sometimes. And I know not all situations are like mine. I've also had conversations with parents who were victims of abusive children. But I can't help but feel skeptical of parents who complain about their children cutting them out as if they are ungrateful brats rather than trying to understand their children's pain. With this particular sort of parent, there is never any evidence they are taking responsibility for how they may have contributed to their children's estrangement. And this makes me uncomfortable. It's very difficult to separate from your parents. Although my mother was abusive and my father an enabler, this didn't make it any easier to leave. It took over 20 years for me to finally cut them out because we had a trauma bond. Although it has been over four years since I cut my parents out of my life, the trauma bond remains. Every day I have to resist the urge to reconcile with them. So when parents of estranged children insist their kids cut me out for no reason just like that, in a way that makes it clear they are making sure people believe they are the victim. In case their children tell their side of the story, it makes my skin crawl. Abusers are manipulative. They manipulate their victims, and they manipulate the people around them. I see these uninvited conversations as manipulation. Why have you brought this up out of nowhere? Why are you trying to convince me? Why do you need me to agree? Why aren't you putting this energy into working on yourself and your relationship with your children? Children don't want to break off their relationship with their parents, whether that child is 25 or 65. The still face experiment by Dr. Edward Tronick in 1975 showed babies will attempt to fix a bond with their caregiver. An infant, after three minutes of interaction with a non-responsive expressionless mother, rapidly sobers and grows wary. He makes repeated attempts to get the interaction into its usual reciprocal pattern. When these attempts fail, the infant withdraws and orients his face and body away from his mother with a withdrawn, hopeless facial expression, writes Edward Tronick. So this parent calls me this, uh, the other day for the first time, this mother, and she says to me, my child, seven months old, he isn't connecting to me. There must be something desperately wrong. Can you fix him? <laughs> As I often do, and this is quite non-traditional, I visit the homes of my clients. Because what I can see within moments, I will take years to see unfold in an office. And if I, if I see that the client is committed enough and in desperate need enough, I will make that visit to the home. So I happen to chance upon feeding time. It couldn't be that a seven-month-old doesn't connect to its mother, I thought to, it, to myself. Unless, of course, there was something drastically wrong with it. I began to observe, and what she said was true. This baby, here was the mother, and here was the baby. The baby refused to look at its mother, disengaged, disinterested, disconnected. This was truly happening. But then the funniest thing began to happen. I began to engage with it. I began to laugh with it, make funny faces, play with it. And then 
the baby began to respond to me. How could that be? Its eyes followed every movement. It began giggling back at me, the perfect mirror. But yet, barely a year old, just at seven months, already so sophisticated, had morphed itself to react to a less than good enough environment. When the mother goes back to being attentive and expressive, the infant is overjoyed. This experiment shows our need for connection with our parents starts very early in life. Much like the infants in this experiment, as a grown-up child I would feel overjoyed if my parents apologized and proved they had changed. Maybe these children leave their parents because they are brave, not because they are ungrateful brats. Maybe they gave their parents plenty of chances to repair their bond. In any other abusive relationship, we would admire the victim for leaving and becoming a survivor. Yet when the perpetrator is a parent, these actions aren't met with admiration, often, people feel sympathy for the parents who have lost their children. The last time I had one of these conversations with a parent, have you asked your daughter why she isn't talking to you? They replied they hadn't. Obviously, I asked why, and they hastily responded, she won't tell me why. They thought I was on their side and felt sorry for them. Poor thing, they don't know why their child cut them out. But due to their response, I felt like I knew why, and they knew why too. I have no idea what I've done wrong. Pretending you don't know is what you have done wrong. Pushing your children to break a really strong bond, is what you have done wrong. Not learning from this, and taking accountability for what you have done wrong. And the most hurtful part is that you haven't learned a thing. You continue to put your ego first, by spreading your version of events, rather than listening to the pain of your children. That is what you've done wrong. Do you, know, do you understand mirroring in childhood? For those of you that don't, when a child is a small child and they feel angry, any type of response that that child gets tells the child about themselves. So they start to develop a self-concept based off of the mirroring they're getting, which is why it's really important, even when you're sitting down with a small child and they feel angry, to say something like, oh, I see that you're angry. You're mirroring that they have that emotion. So the child goes, oh, you're right, anger, that is what I feel. That's me right now, at this moment. And so you can either mirror positive or negative or all of it, but mirroring is super critical, and a lot of families do this poorly quite frankly. There's nothing worse you can do, by the way, than to ignore a kid, because that is to reflect nothing, and the child learns nothing about themselves. But adults aren't infants, and neither are children. And if you treat them like they are, you undermine them. You, 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 you pathologize them. You turn them into old infants. That's an ugly thing. And that's the Freudian nightmare. You know, and, and this happens in therapy very frequently. I mean, you can be tangled into a terrible relationship with your father. That's often either because he was absent, abusive, or tyrannical, something like that. But the, the, the standard pathology with mom is she did everything for you. Well, what's left for you to do? Nothing, including never leaving. Well, you just keep them infants. They'll never leave. That's what the mother does. But adults are not infants. And all you do is destroy them when you treat them that way, especially when they're adolescents and just starting to develop. A part of the reason why it's useful to have a mother and a father is because the mother has to fall insanely in love with the infant or she'd throw it out the window, right? Because they're, they're insanely demanding and they're always right, right? Because the right way is, I'll do everything for you and you're always right and your needs take priority over everyone's, everyone else's and anybody that threatens you is terrible. Exactly right. You can do it, you can do it. As you get older, <clears throat> by the time you're in your mid-twenties, something like that, you should start having a relationship with your parents that's approximately one of peers. And you can tell if you have that, so here's a little trick you can use. So you have parents, obviously, they have friends. You probably care what your parents think, I would imagine. Do you care what their friends think of you? And the answer to that is, well, not nearly as much. And so then I would say, well, why do you care what your parents think of you then? If by the time you're 30, if what your parents think of you matters more than what, say, a random set of their friends think of you, then you've still got your parents confused with, with God. That's one way of looking at it. You've still got them confused with an archetype, and you're still a child. When the power dynamic shifts, which it will, that you'll be the person that can carry things forward. Well, you can't do a better thing for them than that, 
right? That's the best of all possible outcomes for your parents. Hello and welcome, welcome to She TV, the place to become powerfully feminine from the inside out. I am Candace O'Neill. In today's video, I'm going to talk to you about how and why do we emasculate men, and more importantly, how to stop doing it. Now, here are just some of the ways that women emasculate men: questioning them, not letting them lead, controlling them, withdrawal, being critical, being ungrateful punishing them, demeaning them, not respecting them, blaming them and comparing them to others. Boy oh boy did I used to do this to men in the past. Now all of those things above are the realm of what I call the false feminine. We disempower men as if it's a zero-sum game. Now what that means is we believe that if we give our true feminine more time and energy that we'll lose something, be less successful, less powerful, less safe or less effective. It is the beliefs that uphold that that is why we unconsciously masculate men. So what are these beliefs? Why do we do this? Here are some of the reasons why. We don't know how to get our needs met, so we take control, criticize, demean and blame. Why do we do this? We're afraid of letting go and trusting his masculine to lead. When we feel fear, we lash out and blame someone outside of ourselves, often those closest to us. We believe that it is only from our masculine that we can be successful, effective or powerful. We believe we'll be dominated or taken advantage of. And so many other reasons. Well, these beliefs are altogether erroneous. We've adopted these beliefs and taken them on to be our own. We can, however, be more powerful, effective and successful from our feminine. And we actually get our real deep desires and needs met when we learn how to be more feminine. You stop caring about their best interests and you simply fight against them for your own. By doing so, you go into a narcissistic bubble perceptual reality where you're the only thing that you consider because you're convinced that's the way to keep yourself safe. Remember, to seek forgiveness is absolutely important. Don't be too proud to say I'm sorry to people. No matter who you are, in some cultures, a parent, a grandparent, or a mother-in-law or father-in-law, or an elderly person, an older person, will never, ever, ever say, I'm sorry, forgive me. In some cultures, they simply will not. They somehow believe they have a stamp on their backs saying, Jannah, that's it. I do what I want, Jannah. Wallahi, those who are Mubasharina bil Jannah, the story is over. They are already gone. Their names are written. Your name is not from amongst theirs. So don't, no matter who you are and what relation you have, your son, you can go to him. Your daughter, you can go to her. Please forgive me if I have wronged you. Sometimes you might want to say, and we don't know sometimes what these people hold against us. You know what? If I have done something knowingly or unknowingly, forgive me. Let me know what I've done. You'll be surprised. They'll also take that book out of the little dressing table and start reading for you. Pages, every night, come to me, bedtime, I'll read for you 10 a day. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. If you're one of these people, other people are going to relate to you as if you're a serious narcissist, right? But it's not really that you've just gone into this protection mechanism where you're only considering your own best interest because that's the only way to stay safe. It's really just that the only reason you only think about the impact on you and not the impact on anyone around you is because you think you can't have any impact or you don't. You may not like to hear this, but literally everything you think, say, and do affects everything else in existence, most especially those things that are closest to you in any system. This means you have to be acutely aware of the power that you have over others or not even over others, the power that you have to influence and impact others, to not see your power is an incredibly dangerous thing. And it's not just dangerous for you. It's dangerous for literally everything else. I mean literally everything. It's a super, super dangerous condition. Imagine a surgeon. When a surgeon is performing a surgery, 
he or she absolutely must be aware of the power that he or she has in that situation. If the surgeon does not realize that he or she has as much power to kill a person as to save them, the surgeon himself or herself is a dangerous being. The surgeon would approach the situation from outside reality, and because of this, he or she might approach the situation from the wrong perspective, with the wrong energy, and make choices that have severe negative impact and influence on other people, as well as themselves. Here's another example of not recognizing where your power has serious negative impact on others. I want you to imagine that you have absolutely no awareness that somebody else is very connected to you and attached to you. If you're not aware of this, you may just see something over there that really interests you, and so you leave the person because you're chasing something that's of interest to you. Having no awareness of how abandoning them in that way is causing serious negative impact on their life and is damaging them immensely. And, you know, you, you bring kids into a step-parent family, they do not do as well. Step-parents are not as good parents as biological parents, and the data on that is clear. Now, obviously, there are exceptions, because there are terrible biological parents, and there are wonderful step-parents. But if you look in aggregate, it's not that easy to care for children. You need everything you can binding you to them. And if they're someone else's children, mostly they get in the way of the person that you love, right? Let's say you have a child and I want to go out with you. Every second you spend with that child is the second you don't spend with me. And, and there's going to be a price for that. I'm not going to be happy about that. And, and if I have a child, you're going to feel exactly the same way. You might say, well, no, I love children. It's like, yeah, yeah, sure. Sure you do. I doubt it. You might love your child. And, and you know, it's pretty specific the way that people love children. It is a guarantee that if you think back on your life, especially those times when you were the most vulnerable, such as childhood, you have experienced what it is to feel like the other person only had a me and not a you. It is easy to see just how impacted we were by that. It is also easy to see when someone had a you, not just a me, how safe that made us and how positively impacted we were by it. It is also a guarantee that if you think back on your life, you have experienced the horror of watching someone who did not have a you and the amount that that narcissistic state of being damaged another living thing. The people who do not want to recognize a you in the world or a you in any relationship tend to be the people that fear that if they take responsibility for the impact that they have on the other things around them, they will lose their me. So one thing that a woman really wants to know about a man, or perhaps you might say one thing that femininity wants to know about masculinity, is that it's not a predatory tyrant. A courageous weight is to offer a hand in courageous trust and to invite forward a partner from the monster. That's the, that's the mythological manner in which this is supposed to be undertaken. The courageous a, a, a courageous part of the woman's journey, let's say, is to face the monstrosity of a man and to invite out of that something more noble to emerge. Let's say you got a jellyfish, right? I like jellyfish. I think they're pretty. Let's say you've got one in a tank, but a three-year-old loves the jellyfish. So she gets a blanket and she gets the jellyfish out of the water and cuddles her just like a puppy. That's us in relationships, you guys, because we fail to understand the being in front of us. If you came to understand a jellyfish, you'd know that would kill it. So then you'd see, hmm, its best interest is to stay in the water. We end up like this, feeling like everybody's against us because that never happened. Like the people in our lives never looked at us like that jellyfish, you know. What is she really like? What does she really feel? What is this thing that I'm doing really being received like? So that there can be an adjustment for your best interests. The other element of that seems to me to be that you're irredeemable. Then the best thing to do is to render you harmless. And if we're going to obscure the relationship between competence and power, and assume that all of your striving upward is merely a manifestation of power, then what we'll do is weaken you as much as possible so that harmlessness can replace virtue. Ideology. So the aim is the emasculation of the man. Yeah, that's the evil queen. Yeah. Yeah, because we have the evil king, right? That's the tyrannical patriarchy. Well, the evil queen is lurking somewhere. Yes.
It doesn't take a genius to see that in most ways, this is a man's world. Powerlessness is the reason that women have become so incredibly manipulative. If you would like more information on this, you can watch my video titled The Number One Reason You Can't Reach Enlightenment for Men and for Women. Women had control and power over almost nothing. The one place which we were allowed to have control and power was over the home and especially over children. It's with this in mind that for the sake of awakening, I'm about to expose to you one of the biggest shadows that has occurred within the female race as a result of this generational experience. It's called the castration dynamic. So often women exact their unhealthy power and manipulation in the area of the home with a special emphasis on the children. And though there are many unhealthy ways that this manifests, one of them is affecting human society profoundly. Basically, feeling like we, as women, had no control over the men in our lives and their tyranny over us. Whether it was brothers, uncles, daddies, husbands. We basically ended up with one choice. We became afraid of men, but could do very little about it. We could not be seen as equal. We were deeply hurt by them. So, having no control over the actual source of the problem, we turned our sights on our sons. We turned our sights on the very thing that we had control of. Yeah, this should scare you. Because basically what we did is we tried to eradicate the man in our own sons. We made our sons completely dependent on us so they couldn't grow up. We taught them to be afraid of their own manhood. We taught them that there was something shameful and harmful about being a man. We sought to raise them in a way that it would be impossible for them to grow up and dominate us or any other woman for that matter. We set up a dynamic where in order to get the love they want from us, our boys had to disown their masculinity and personal power. This is a form of castration. What this has done is it has castrated men on an energetic level. It was an attempt on the part of most women to feel safe and we couldn't feel safe around men. So we had to get rid of men. That was the subconscious cycle. Of course, this attempt to gain safety in this way has damaged society at large. It has damaged men and it has even damaged women. Because of this castration dynamic, the shadow of men has actually done a pendulum swing from tyranny and that type of power all the way to passivity, where the divine masculine cannot shine through. You cannot make an enemy of manhood without simultaneously making an enemy or eradicating all of the positive aspects of manhood. Things like initiative, action, purpose, direction, movement, responsibility, strength, focus, fatherhood, generosity, encouragement, material abundance, transformation, and growth. We've created a society of men who have turned against a major part of themselves. As a result, they can't live into their true purpose. Many of them are developing emotional, mental, and physical disorders and illnesses that are a direct result of disowning this masculinity. And let's just be honest, the little side effect that most of us didn't see when we were trying to stay safe by castrating our sons is that we'd end up raising men who we're not attracted to. No one's attracted to a castrated guy. Their energy isn't there. There's no polarity. This guy is passive. This guy is not stepping into his power. He has no responsibility. This is the type of guy where we're like, meh. And instead of us turning into men and them turning into women, what's happened is that we have been left to do everything. To be both the woman and the man. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullah. The advice that I would give you regarding a single mother or single parent raising a son in puberty. There's many advices. The first advice or piece of advice is that he must have a positive male role model in his life. And you must realize that you cannot do it by yourself. If his husband, if his father's not around, he's dead or incarcerated or he left you or he's a deadbeat, unfortunately, no problem. He has to have an uncle or an older brother or a brother at the masjid. Someone has to be a positive role model in his life to make it and survive as a bare necessity, let alone be something, perhaps. But you cannot do it by yourself, sister. And many women, unfortunately, they make that mistake. But sometimes women, they stubbornly and obstinately say, I can raise my son. I don't need a man. I don't need a husband. I can do my... That's not true. You cannot do it. Putting him in an environment of at least one positive brother. All it takes is one. One good brother to influence him, inshallah, and put him on the right path. 
And what's important is, no matter how hard you try, you are not a man. You cannot be a man. You are never meant to be a man. And a man, he must have touch. He has to be in touch with his sensitive side, emotional side, because that's another extreme, being too harsh on your son, a man or a woman, in which they may grow up to be a narcissist, or they may grow up to have be totally insensitive to anything. And many sisters, they make this mistake, and they think that they know better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah created Adam first, then Eve. Allah made Eve from Adam. Huh? The father is, is pivotal to girls as well. A father can't just raise daughters. A woman can't just raise girls. You need a man. Allah created Adam first, then Eve. Allah made Eve from Adam. Huh? The father is, is pivotal. Many women are developing emotional, mental, and physical illnesses as a result of this as well. For human society to be genuinely healthy, what we have to do is to both step into our empowerment. This is not going to happen if women seek to gain more power by making men decrease in the amount of power that they hold. Not at all. This is about women fully embracing the full power of Divine Feminine at the same time as men fully embracing and embodying the full expression of Divine Masculinity. And what happens is, when you maximize the potential of both of those energies, there's a natural balance that occurs. When this is done, you do not see the shadow expressions of either gender. Instead, you see their full potential. The time has come for women to clearly see that this is what we may have done, may currently be doing, or may do in the future if we're not aware of the fact that we keep trying to stay safe from men by taking the man out of our sons. We need to be awake enough to face our own pain relative to men rather than preventing our sons from becoming men. And the time has come for men to see this dynamic clearly so they can break free of it and own their own masculine energy for the first time. It's right for you as men right now in the world today if you've been part of this castration dynamic to feel angry, to feel like you were used as an accessory. If you have the bravery and the strength to own your own masculinity, then you can be one of those rare men walking the planet who's not only improved your own life immensely by doing this, but who can also prove to women that it's not being a man in and of itself that makes women unsafe. So how do you change this? How do you stop emasculating men? Essentially, it's about a relearning of feminine things, ways of being, ways of acting and doing. It's about bringing the masculine and feminine into harmony inside of yourself, as well as in an harmonious relationship between yourself and others. It's about an embodiment of the feminine arts, because when we do that, it totally changes the dynamics. It totally changes the playing field. It's an emergence into your queen, your true feminine power. It's a learning of feminine arts and skills. It's an embracement of feminine community, sisterhood and mentorship. It comes with identifying your needs and desires, learning how to speak them and then how to receive them. And it has to be about an embodied version of the feminine. Otherwise, the transformation doesn't happen. Otherwise, you're going to continue to emasculate men. It is through the embodiment of the feminine that you experientially plug into your power. You experientially recognize and remember the innate power that is held in your body and that you don't have to keep fighting, you don't have to keep defending, and you can actually let Go and have faith that the masculine will provide for you. The masculine of the divine or a man. You allow him, his beautiful, powerful, providing, supportive masculine to come toward you. So let's all here today make a decision to stop emasculating men. It doesn't have to continue down this track. As you learn to embrace, embody and love your own feminine body and power, you will realize that you didn't need to do that all along and you certainly don't need to be continuing to do that moving forward. I'm going to tell you something that's going to change the way you think about things. It is not possible to heal relational trauma outside the context of relationships. 
That's why so many of you are stuck, you see? And in the spiritual field, we make you more stuck. Because we're like, well, everything you need comes from within. Not if you've had relational trauma, no. What you need quite literally comes from other people. There's no way to fix it besides that. It's about in your relationships, and this should be a conscious thing. It's not going to be a fight between me or you. Relationships are about and. Do you frequently find that you need time to yourself? Do you identify yourself as somebody who really needs and likes alone time? Now, technically, we're a social species. Our species' survival depended upon being next to each other. Connection. Technically, connection is the top human need. So how can it be that you feel better when you're alone? How can it be that you need so much space? I want you to notice that when you need alone time or when you need space, this never includes your family dog or your cat or plants, but they're living and your pets need you. But you're not really turning around to your family dog saying, look, I just need space and time to myself right now. So what's the variable? Why is it about people? I'm gonna tell you today something that most people will find controversial at face value. It's that if you identify as somebody who likes your alone time and needs a lot of space, it means that you're struggling with inauthenticity. The difference between your dog and a person is that you feel like you can completely be in alignment with your unique desires, needs, perspectives, feelings, thoughts, and do whatever you want to do when you are with your dog. And you don't feel like you can do any of that with the person. There is a big incongruence between your internal self and your external self when you're around people. This leads to both pressure and exhaustion. It is hard to act differently than you feel. It is hard to do what you don't want to do. It is hard to tailor every word and action to the response you want to get from them. Enmeshment trauma is a difficult thing and very, very common for the human species. Now let's think about enmeshment trauma. It's basically nobody listening to boundaries. So here's how enmeshment trauma goes. In households where one adult or more refuses to see a child as his or her own person and instead regards them as an extension of themselves, the child is not allowed to have their own desires, needs, perspectives, feelings, or thoughts. There were consequences for that. In order to maintain the secure connection they needed with this adult, they have to lose their sense of themselves. They have to forfeit their autonomy. Therefore, the desire to develop a sense of self is as strong for them as the desire for merging is for people who have suffered abandonment trauma. When you're away from other people, meaning you've pushed them away now or you've run away and now you're alone, now you can't actually attune to somebody. And so in that moment, you have access to what you need. You can feel what you want. You can figure out what your internal truth is. You can feel yourself. The price for connection for you is to lose yourself. Now, to give you a view of the flip side, people who are in relationships with you, they really suffer. The reason is they feel pushed away by you. Why do they feel this way? Because they're right. To get a sense of self, you are pushing them away, chronically, impulsively, just so that you can feel yourself. So usually people let themselves be pushed away more than a few times, and then it starts to corrode their own self-esteem, continually being pushed away. When you are unconscious of this dynamic, it is only through that friction of defiance and rebellion to another person that you have a sense of yourself as an individual, and this in fact feels safer to you. Here's the bottom line, pushing people away is not a good thing, especially if you're pushing away people you love. It hurts them and ultimately you as well. It's a reaction you have to a threat. That threat is absorption. Being alone can be a good tool to use to get in touch with yourself, but remember that it's a tool. It is not actually necessary for a physical human. Feel the resistance you just had to that statement? That should tell you something about yourself. Now, I'm gonna make a revolutionary statement here. Because of the way that a physical human is designed, if you could be completely authentic around other people, you wouldn't actually need space to yourself. <laughs> you don't have to take my word for it, go try it out. That's why some people are so much easier for you to just be around no matter what, and other people aren't. Commit to authenticity regardless of whether you are in the room with another person or not. If you let this happen, 
What will happen is a natural sifting process. Yeah, if you've been inauthentic, chances are you're surrounded by people who are in love with the mask and not really the real you. So there will be a process where some people are like, nah, peace out, I was here for the mask, not really here for the real you. However, the universe doesn't like open spaces. It loves to fill them in. And so what will happen when those people gravitate away from you is that the place that they occupied now becomes occupied by people who can actually love you for your authentic and real self. Here's the reality. Unless you're willing to show somebody who you really are, that means what's real about you, what you really think, how you really feel, what you really want, your genuine desires, your thoughts, all of these things, emotions, then nobody can actually reach the core of you. They're just talking to the mask. And so nobody can really love you for who you are. And what you want is connection, connection with who you really are. So be brave enough to take this step. I want to talk about how narcissistic mothers with their sons set their sons up to be nice guys that only attract narcissistic women. And I'm going to be honest, sons of narcissistic women, especially when they're the scapegoat, tend to be really nice guys. Now, I'm not talking about the nice guy that sacrifices himself. I'm talking about like a genuinely good person, okay? In fact, let's distinguish it. Nice guy and good person, okay? They tend to be really, really good people. They have a really good heart. They have zero desire to hurt anybody. They want to make other people happy. They have amazing qualities. They're very humble. They have a lot of beautiful qualities. However, the narcissistic mother trains their sons to go from being good to being the nice guy that doesn't attract healthy people. So let's get into how a narcissistic mom takes a good person and turns them into a nice guy that tends to attract narcissistic women. So if that son is the scapegoat, then everything he does will be wrong. Everything Anytime he thinks of his own needs, anytime he has a differing opinion, anytime he speaks up for himself, anytime he calls out bad behavior of the narcissistic mom, he will be shamed. That child knows that their survival is dependent on that parent. And so as a coping skill, survival comes first. Survival trumps happiness. Survival trumps authenticity. And so the child to survive starts taking all the things that the parent doesn't like, including the good qualities, like being assertive, being a leader, speaking his, his mind, having confidence, believing in him, believing in himself. All of those qualities, if they get in the way of the narcissistic mother controlling that child, anytime the child engages in them, healthy behaviors, that child will be punished. Okay. So done over and over and over. Your suffering doesn't matter as long as mom isn't angry. Never have a different opinion. So all of that is downloaded into the narcissistic mother's son, right? So years go by and now that young boy is a man and he's going into relationships and guess what? The man or the boy can grow physically, right? From boy to man, but the subconscious programs, they don't grow with time. And if you learn things on a conscious level, just because you learn on a conscious level that men are allowed to say no, men are allowed to say no, men are allowed to take the lead, men are allowed to be assertive, doesn't mean that that conscious information has penetrated your subconscious programs. So even before getting involved in a relationship, let's say they're starting to get involved in a relationship, they'll do a few things that are the direct result of having been raised by a narcissistic mom. They will be extremely, extremely externally focused on what the other person is thinking about them to the point that they don't often even reflect on how do I feel about this person? Their thoughts are, does she like me? And without realizing it, the programs in childhood that we learned in, in our home will often get kicked on in a relationship. 
And that's where a good person, because of trauma, gets shoved into that, that category of nice guy that sacrifices self for others. And the reason why a healthy person wouldn't be attracted to that, it's not that a healthy person wants the bad boy, wants the bad guy. It's that because the trauma is preventing you from being authentic, you couldn't be more authentic than when you were a child. All you knew was authenticity. And if a parent broke that, treated that as if it was bad, made you feel as if it was dangerous, that doesn't go away with time. That's the trauma aspect of it. That's the CPTSD recovery part that we all need to go through in order to break out of the dynamics of narcissistic relationships. So a healthy person isn't attracted to that, again, because it's not authentic, they can feel it. If they've been pushed into that nice person spectrum, right, because of trauma, that was a coping skill in childhood that was very effective, but it is super maladaptive in adulthood because it winds up pushing away healthy people and it winds up attracting the very kind of person that caused you to have the trauma in the first place. A narcissist, a female narcissist loves that kind of person. Oh, you don't care about you, you care about me? Check, narcissistic, a female narcissist loves that. Oh, my perspective matters and yours doesn't? Check. You wanna be responsible for my feelings? Check. Okay, so I know there are a lot of good guys, good, good individuals that unfortunately grew up with a narcissistic mother and they were conditioned to be shoved into that nice person role. And that term nice person is basically saying that you do anything and everything to make other people happy and you don't matter. Your parents, what they're telling you is not revelation from the heavens. They could be making a mistake, remember that. But generally, out of their love for you, they will be guiding you in the right direction, hopefully. But sometimes they're making a mistake because they don't know. This is why we need communication with our children such that we should allow them to disagree with us so that we can guide them. So my brothers and sisters, remember this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful. We as parents in this day and age should definitely allow our children to disagree with us. And we should engage them in discussion because if we don't, we're going to lose them. People cry tears. I lost my child. I lost my, my son. For example, they, they no longer want to listen to me. They no longer want to live with me. They Whatever else, sometimes they've left the faith. They've done this and that. You know what? too late. You are trying to develop a relationship now when all these years you had to develop it and you did not. What's the point of coming to cry now? My parents, the age has changed. You have to be in such communication with your children that when they have a problem, they can tell it to you. I don't think many parents can actually boast that type of a close relationship. I don't think so. That means we're guilty because then they will turn to others. They will turn to others. We need to have a good relationship. Respect indeed. There needs to be communication. And you need to understand that at the end of the day, these are my folks. These are my parents. And dear parents, learn to forgive your children. Learn to excuse them. Learn to let them make mistakes sometimes. I'd rather have a child who's made a mistake and come back from that mistake than have a child whom I tried to impose on on them an ideal set of living such that they became depressed and they're now on lifetime medication and it has happened and it continues to happen because of how we treat our children how are the children of narcissistic mothers affected profoundly and enduringly the sons of narcissistic mothers display particular characteristics that emerge from the unhealthy relationship the mother established as he was growing up there is either too much attention, as the mother is overly enmeshed with her son, or not enough attention, as the son suffers from neglect. Both extremes damage the psyche and wound the soul. Sons of narcissistic mothers are pressured to be perfect, a dutiful extension of her desires, 
or put down as incompetent if they attempt to forge their own identity. Or they are simply ignored because she is too self-absorbed, so they learn nothing of female love. 1. Exalted and Exhausted Expectations Beginning, the narcissistic mother has great expectations for her son. Since she sees him as an extension of her superior self, it stands to reason that he will be more intelligent, more talented, and more attractive than the other little boys. It is only when he begins to develop his own individuality that the mother is thwarted. As soon as the son exhibits independence, the narcissistic mother either becomes enraged or loses interest in him. The unpredictability and conditional nature of her love compromises his self-esteem, leaving him insecure and isolated. What's more, her abuse often gets worse with age. Number 2. Inability to Set Priorities Since narcissistic mothers exert an undue amount of control on their sons, these boys will likely grow up to be men who don't have a firm sense of boundaries or a clear sense of priorities. They will be accustomed to allowing someone else to set the parameters of a relationship, especially for them. Number 3. Undeserving Codependent Sons of narcissistic mothers often feel unworthy because his mother's love was always conditional and never guaranteed. They become people-pleasers, constantly desperate to get the approval of others, even at the cost of authenticity and sincerity. It can seem a little like narcissism, but there are some key differences between codependency and narcissism. This codependent behavior means that these sons aren't able to express their feelings readily and genuinely, and their sense of identity is stunted. They garner their self-worth from what they can do for others, rather than from an innate confidence. They often feel undeserving of love. Number 4. Inhibited Intimacy Certainly, because these sons feel undeserving of love, their ability to express their true feelings and engage in intimacy is compromised. Because the narcissistic mother always judged him harshly and constantly, he fears being judged by his partner and so will often shut them out. He is also wary of intimacy because he doesn't want to be controlled or manipulated by a partner or spouse the way he once was controlled and manipulated by his mother. He tends to keep his distance and may be unable to form lasting relationships. The more a partner pushes, the more distant and defensive he may become. Number 5. Resentful Passive Aggressiveness This tug of war in his relationships, where the partner wants more intimacy and the son wants more autonomy, often results in aggression. Sons of narcissistic mothers fear being exploited by women especially, and they may automatically mistrust any woman who asks more of them. This takes form in one of two ways. Sons of narcissistic mothers either become verbally and physically aggressive, even abusive, or they become passive-aggressive. Number 6. Repetitive Patterns of Behavior all of the damage done to sons of narcissistic mothers emerge into a pattern of behavior that replicates much of what the mother demonstrated. This can manifest in the son's desire for relationships with older women who dominate and control them. He is still looking for his mother's love and acceptance into adulthood. Or these sons may become overly vested in their partners, acting as hovering caregivers in an attempt to make up for the lack of affection in their early life. Number 7. Morphing into Mom In the most extreme incarnation of the damage done to sons of narcissistic mothers, 
they will eventually become narcissists themselves. This is when they are unable or unwilling to grapple with the lasting psychological damage that was wrought by an ego-driven and empathy-lacking mother. Daughters of narcissistic mothers often become competitors, at least in the eyes of mom, while sons of narcissistic mothers are often idealized and even idolized. This exceptional treatment from mom, even when she alternately criticizes and disappoints him, might lead to narcissistic feelings of superiority and a need to gratify his ego. All children of narcissistic mothers are harmed by their upbringing. Family, there are complex interactions that take place and roles that people end up in. The emotional interdependence and even the most abusive and disconnected homes. In a human social group like a family, there are complex interactions that take place and roles that people end up in. The emotional interdependence and even the most abusive and disconnected homes still makes it so that a change in one person creates reciprocal changes in every other member of the group. In a dysfunctional social group, the strongest member of the family will be targeted. Now, what I mean by strongest is, is that any social group creates patterns of dysfunctionality. And the strongest member is the member that goes against these patterns of dysfunctionality. They're the one that doesn't feed into them. And therefore, they're the ones that cause everyone else to be triggered about them. Now, this strongest member of the group being targeted will now become the group problem, or the family problem. All of the emotional and mental discomfort that is experienced by the group as a whole is deflected and projected onto this person who is expected to bear it so that the other members of the group don't have to face that discomfort in themselves. The subconscious goal here is in fact catharsis. The scapegoat is the one that is selected to suffer so that the other members of the family don't have to. And that person is the reason for the family's problems and suffering. Here's an example. A mother doesn't actually want a child, but she has been led by society to believe that that's the only acceptable role for her to have. And in fact, that's the only way for her to guarantee that she's going to get love long term. So she has a child. Now this child is going to have its own needs, have its own desires, have its own thoughts. It's going to be its own unique being. But when it's born to a mother that doesn't really want a child, a mother that just wants validation, for example, this isn't going to go so well. When this mother has to run around and cater to this child's thoughts and needs and desires and accommodate the child in such an extreme way, it's going to bring up her unresolved issues around wanting to do what she wants to do in life. And the very real fact that society led her in the exact opposite direction of her genuine desires in the direction of what society says she needs to be doing with her life. Now, instead of facing the fact that she never wanted to be a mother, instead of facing the fact that the real selfish truth is that she wants to do what she wants to do, she's going to make the child the issue. You're so selfish, she's going to say when the child asks for something. She's going to be constantly exasperated, tell the story that her life ended when her daughters began. She has made the problem the child and projected her own sins, so to speak, onto the child in order to avoid the discomfort of accepting that she does not want a child and she is selfish and that she wants to do what she wants to do, not dedicate her life to another person's care. It is at this point that the child has become a scapegoat. Of course, it's difficult for a scapegoat in any social group to really genuinely understand they're not to blame and not at fault. Why? Because it doesn't make sense that if they're not at fault, why the hell they're being treated this way? What the scapegoat does with this extreme confusion that they're trapped in their whole life of trying to figure out just what it is that they did that was so bad to deserve this treatment, is that they will go on a lifelong mission to try to figure out what's bad about themselves and fix it, and yet nothing they ever do will ever turn up anything that they're actually able to fix so as to get the love they need from the people around them. Why? Because resolving things was never the intention of the family or social group in the first place. In other words, it was never a motive of anyone in the group for that person to not be the problem. It served them for that person to be the problem. As long as that person was the problem, they could avoid looking at themselves, and that is the biggest gaslight of all. Basically, everyone's like, we really do want you to fix the fact that you're such a problem for us, but that's a gaslight, because they don't. What they want is to make someone the problem so that they can avoid facing themselves. The scapegoat 
can spend a lifetime paying for sins they never committed. Now, because we live in a universe based on the law of mirroring, what some people call the law of attraction, there's this crappy little thing that happens. When you have been scapegoated, and this is the basis of your life, you will go on to be scapegoated again, and again, and again, and again. You have a very clear option when a social group turns you into a scapegoat. And that is, you either instantaneously conform, or you suffer the wrath of being excluded, of being made to be the problem, and being treated and seen as the problem, by the way, comes with a great many consequences socially. <laughs> when a social group starts to scapegoat you and you can't conform or don't conform in some way, then what happens is a very specific pattern. You have to first buy into the fact that you're the family problem, and you have to adopt this as your way of seeing yourself. When you do this, you are no longer resisting the way that this group sees you. You're no longer resisting the way they want to use you within the group. Therefore, they're going to stop resisting you in that way, to a degree. In this atmosphere of non-resistance to the horrible identity that's being projected onto you and to all the things you're being blamed for, <laughs> actually allows the people in their social group to switch up their game now and to avoid their unresolved issues even further. They do this by considering themselves, at this point, the healer and the fixer of you. At this point, the scapegoat becomes the identified patient in the social group. They use the idea of themselves as a good person for focusing on and helping and fixing you to further avoid their own pain. The thing is, they're creating the very pain in you that they say is your personality defect and flipping it so as to heal it. Now, this is disgusting. This social pattern is disgusting when you really get it. It is so dysfunctional, and it is such an extreme form of gaslight. Imagine that I walked up to you with a lead pipe, and I knocked your feet out from under you. Now you're rolling around on the ground and you're in pain. And it's at this point that I get down on the floor next to you, and the first thing I say is, God, you just have so many problems. I mean, do you understand when you're always acting in pain like this? It's a problem because it takes all of the focus off of the family. And I can't put my energy into the other siblings that I need to put my energy into because you're taking so much focus away from me. And when you continue to cry, I then one-up this. Not only did I just make you the problem, now I'm going to switch and escape my own unresolved issues even further by becoming your fixer. So now down on the ground after I've said that, you know, I'm, I'm definitely here for you. I see that you have problems. I recognize it. We can definitely find a doctor who can help you with the fact that you're in so much pain all the time. Yeah, that's a scary gaslight. That is life for a scapegoat in a family unit. The vast majority of children who are brought to psychologists and psychiatrists are, in fact, family scapegoats in this exact situation. But the sad thing is that playing into this pattern by accepting themselves as the problem saves the scapegoat from abandonment, annihilation, and further wounding by the people in their lives. Your only frame of reference for closeness with other people is when they're trying to fix you now. You're the kid who sees... Even if there's a part of you that wonders whether you're bad or not, that mom didn't actually want a kid. Basically, you know that there is an extreme form of deflection and projection going on. Because if you are in the frequency of yourself always being to blame, that means other people will always blame you. Haven't you noticed this interesting little quality about the universe that the people who do not actually, in fact, blame themselves often don't get blamed by others? <laughs> Yes, if you are a scapegoat, there is going to be nothing more triggering than those moments when you're watching a movie and someone is blamed for something they didn't do, convicted of a crime they didn't commit, and can say nothing because they're already condemned. Because this is your life, isn't it? You're going to be scapegoated and blamed for things, even though you didn't do it. And the pattern that's actually creating this on a vibrational level is the pattern of blaming yourself so as to stay virtuous. What this means is it isn't safe. It also isn't love. When someone's focusing at you constantly in terms of you being the bad one and the wrong one and then turning themselves into the fixer of you, you have thought that has been love. That is not love in any way, shape, or form. That is a person feeding off of you for the sake of their own self-concept. It is consumption. It's a form of parasitism in order to avoid their own pain. 
This means, as a scapegoat, the hardest thing you will ever accept and the one you need to is that they don't love you. They don't. They do not take you as part of themselves at all. In a universe based on love mirroring, if you blame yourself, you will be blamed. It's very important to get yourself out of this pattern of constantly blaming yourself so you're not a match to that because, yet again, extreme consequences can happen as a result of being blamed, especially being blamed for things you didn't do. You are blaming yourself to maintain a sense of goodness so you're nothing like those people who hurt you. But you don't need to worry about becoming like those people. You are more than willing to see what you did wrong and to see that things are negative about you. You've been practicing this bravery all your life. People who scapegoat others are by definition not being authentic. In that lack of authenticity, they're not able to actually do anything to resolve it, are they? Therefore, they have to deflect and project. That means own your truth to not be like them. Don't blame yourself. Do narcissists uh, go together? Do they attract one another? The answer is, is simply yes. Um, it will depend on the situation. They, they have the same viewpoint of life and they process things the same way. They feed off of one another's delusions and so it's easy for them to be attracted to each other and to uh, stay in that relationship. First of all, Islam says that when a woman gets married to another man, her children custody must be taken out or away from her and given back to her husband. This is the norm because I, as a divorced father, would not want my children to be raised up in the house of another man who's not related to my daughter, who's not related to my son. I don't know how he's going to treat them. This is the default. If the children are to be raised in your house, they have no obligation towards you. Yes, you're paying the rent and you're paying for the food. Most likely their father is paying their mom for their food and for their rent. So they're chipping in with the expenses. They're not obliged to obey you. They're not obliged to treat you as a father. And you have no right on sh uh, uh, in shouting at them or uh, hitting them, reprimanding them, reprimanding them. You don't have any right. You don't have any right reprimanding them. You're their stepfather. That's it. However, if I have children of my wife growing up in my house, I have to be diplomatic. First of all, I have to win their hearts. So they have to have the true conviction that I love them, that I care for them like I care for my own children. Secondly, I have to know my limits. So just because I love them, this does not entitle me to beat them up or reprimand them. No, the real father has this power, not me. So I have to know my limits and not exceed that. Thirdly, I should not have high expectations of them obeying, the, obeying me, serving me like I do with my children. I wouldn't expect that from my stepchildren. But if I get such treatment, alhamdulillah, it's a, this is a win-win. So you have to know your limits and Allah knows best. When our closeness, you and I, um, when our intimacy, our friendship, our relationship is based on the hatred, the despising, the dislike of a common enemy you and I have, that that bond that we have is, is artificial and fake and forced because it is founded on a common hatred that we have rather than founded on a sense of common humanity that we both share, which will give more longevity and stronger authentic glue.
more than ever, people are forming common enemy friendships, common enemy alliances. And when our alliances and our relationships and friendships are forged through someone, something we both hate and despise, it is fueled by our continued hatred. It is fueled by our continued dislike um, and upset and offense about that person. It's the easiest thing in the world. It's far easier to bond with someone over someone you hate than someone or something you love. But I promise you that whatever your life is built on common enemy intimacy, it is a fake bond amongst us as humans. It is a troublesome one too. It is one that um, needs to be aware of and examined and removed from our network of relationships, personally or corporately. I wonder if you could uh, think today about where you have uh, a relationship, a friendship based on nothing more than a common hate, a common dislike, a common offense that you have taken to the same person. I am going to talk about stepchildren and narcissists. Now, I am speaking from my own experience here and the many people that I have coached and helped with this. When a narcissist um, has a stepchild, how difficult it is for them to, to take them under their wing, if you would. How difficult it is for them to love your child. They might pretend to love them, but the behaviors start to kind of reflect something that's different. The child and, and the, the mother or the father relationship that the existing parent is with, um, they've got some, some bonds that a narcissist very often gets jealous of. They don't like to... Um, not be number one, right? So if your child is in your eyes always going to be number one, then it's going to be really hard for them to adapt. So going forward in other relationships, that's an important thing to note. And I'm not trying to scare you because lots of normal people can have relationships with your child, raise them as their own, and be a very good parent. So that is not what we're saying here. A narcissist might not show these behaviors, certainly at first. It takes time and you need to see them under pressure with your child. You need to see them in a, in a place where the kid might be throwing temper tantrums or might be getting bad grades or might be more work than a narcissist is willing to put into a relationship. Remember, they want everything to be easy. So, um, they will try to break up your relationship with your child um, because to them, it's, it's kind of like um, competition. When you've got a child and it's not theirs. Uh, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake, wake, wake up out of your sleep, wake up, wake up out of your sleep. Wake up, I command you in the name of Jesus. Wake up. Wake up out of your sleep. Wake up. Wake up out of your sleep. The Lord told me to tell you. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Wake up. Um, that, that fake... I can be their step parent kind of act, the mask, if you would, um, is going to be present certainly in the beginning. But remember that through the time and as time passes, that a narcissist will reject the child because it's too much work. It's if the child does something wrong, it's your fault. They don't accept responsibility and. Um, they have to be there for better or for worse. A child that comes into this mix might be a casualty that you don't even see as a possibility yet. If you're um, in a relationship and your children are the step of someone else and you come into this narcissistic relationship, 
watch out for your children. Never stop protecting your children. Never stop loving your children in favor of siding with the narcissist, in favor of, um, you know, sort of trying to appease both. It shouldn't be a, you know, we, we, we have this responsibility or this. It, it should be that you're together and united in this. Make sure that you are protecting yourself against this type of abuse. Today's topic is mothers who choose their boyfriends and their relationships over their children. Now let's understand the psyche of what's going on in here and possibly in here of these loveless mothers. We fail to acknowledge how this has impacted our ability to love, to, to create these, these warm households that we once had. We have to revisit this maternal instinct. And a lot of times, again, that maternal instinct has been turned off. In the minds of that kind of mother, there's a separation, there's a divide. And the, there's the child on one side, and then there's the mother on the other side, on this lack of love. So if a mother chooses her boyfriend or her relationship over their child, even if there's a, any issues there. We've heard stories. We've seen mothers who have blatantly sacrificed the, the safety of their child, uh, completely rejected the idea of providing a sense of safety and security for that child in efforts to secure a bond or relationship with another adult. of series here, and this series is going to take on the issue of the types of things that narcissistic enablers say. Narcissistic enablers are typically gaslighters by tribe. They're collective gaslighters. And they try to put, a lips put lipstick on a pig and try to downplay the harms of a narcissistic person's behavior. In so doing, narcissistic enablers are just one of many in an army of people in the world at large that allow this kind of behavior to continue, to reward it at a societal level, and I guess at some level the enablers just want to be able to stay in their, their world full of, full of denial and then ignore what's happening to others. So today we're going to take on this thing that narcissistic enablers say. They love saying this. Ready? Oh, come on now. They don't mean it. They don't mean, it, mean any harm. So you may hear one or both versions of it. Either they'll say, they don't really mean it when they say that, or they don't mean any harm with what they do. First of all, when someone says that to you about a narcissistic person's behavior, it's so tempting to ask the enabler, how the hell do you know this? How do you know that they don't mean any harm? They harmed me, so what was it? They harmed me, so it was harmful behavior. It can make, these kinds of statements can make a family system or a friendship or a relationship feel like you're in a court of law or a police investigation or a deposition into which you need to be able to establish motive or intent. The fact is I was hurt and now I have to approve that they intended to hurt me? Uh-uh. The tricky bit with this statement that, oh, they don't really mean it. They, they, they don't want to, they, they don't mean to hurt you. They don't mean that is that narcissists are always repeat offenders. Listen, all of us screw up once. All of us say something that could hurt someone else. And then we get corrected and we attempt to never do it again. And we really commit ourselves to never doing it again. Narcissistic people just keep doing and saying the same bad things, even with feedback. We give them feedback on their behavior. We know that doesn't work and they don't change. So for a person, narcissistic person typically who doesn't intend to hurt someone else they got to know they're hurting everyone's telling them that but yet they keep hurting when you keep repeating something and people are telling you what you're doing that sure as hell feels like intent to me now I understand intent as a legal standard but that's this isn't a court of law it's your damned life so when a person says hurtful things pretty regularly that's not okay it's not in fact if you try to pin the narcissist down on intent 
or the enabler tries to pin them down on intent. More often than not, you will be called out for being too sensitive, for having your feelings hurt. Oh golly, you are very sensitive. Who cares? He didn't mean it. Both statements, those enabling statements, they don't mean it or they don't mean any harm. They mean that the narcissist, because of the enablers, are able to keep doing and saying bad things because the presumption then becomes, well, their words aren't intended to harm, so they aren't harming. That's like saying a drunk driver didn't intend to hit you with their car, so they're off the hook. We know that accountability with a narcissist is a pipe dream and something that you're never going to get. But what is, potentially what is potentially possible then is other people not letting them off the hook so easily. Maybe other people can stop enabling them. Other people stepping in and saying, actually, that was not okay. What you just said could hurt someone else. Now, those of you who grew up with a narcissistic parent may have gotten this statement. Oh, they, they didn't mean it. They didn't mean to hurt. They did, that wasn't meant to hurt you. That you may have gotten this nonsense left and right from the other parent or other people in the family system. Oh, come on now. Your father doesn't mean any harm. He doesn't mean it when he says those things. Oh, come on now. Your sister doesn't mean it. She doesn't mean to hurt you. You were harmed. And by making the focus on the intention of the other person, the one who says the hurtful thing, never are the feelings of the harmed person acknowledged. And that feels very invalidating. And that narcissist keeps just getting enabled where people are saying, well, they don't really mean that. In a relationship, friends or people close to you may say, oh, come on now, your partner didn't mean it. They didn't mean any harm. I sometimes wonder, is it because these enablers get uncomfortable because they think, oh goodness, are you telling me life isn't always sunshine? Life can be icky and people might hurt people. Yeah, this isn't third grade. Relationships aren't always moonbeams and rainbows. Or maybe these enablers would actually have to look at their own lives and really take a hard look at what's going on around them. But in the middle of all of this, the narcissist keeps getting enabled. In the workplace, coworkers or management or administration saying, Oh, come on now, your boss or your supervisor or your coworker, they didn't mean any harm. That can actually really set you up badly for getting any kind of meaningful solution from HR or other situations since the prevailing workplace culture is that. Everyone thinking the person who's actually quite abusive always, he didn't really mean it. You just need to know how to take what they say. Again, it pathologizes the person who is affected, who apparently doesn't know how to take it. And what that ultimately means is that that person, who's the brunt of these words, is less likely to get support. It's in this way, narcissistic enablers are just, they, they just further invalidate survivors of these situations and contribute to the larger environment of abuse that, a, that of, around the person who's experiencing this. The person's already being abused, it's just one more way to abuse them. So the big question is, do they mean it? Do the narcissist mean it to hurt you? The bigger, bigger question is, does it really matter? And frankly, that's not for a third person to be weighing in on. The, the enablers, I really do think that they're just, they want to feel better about their own lives. That should not be happening on your time. I really do think that the enablers run heavily on hope. Oh, they don't mean it. They don't want to hurt you. Like, no, people are actually really good. Now, obviously, I have a far, far more skewed, cynical view than anybody out there that people don't mean good. But when you get this, when somebody harms you, hurts you, or somebody's telling you, no, no, ignore what they said, they didn't mean it, unless you've got some kind of decoder ring to let you know when people do and don't mean things, which we don't, I got to assume when someone says something to me, they mean it. And so this idea of narcissistic enablers living in this sort of world of wishful thinking where people couldn't be that mean. Again, this ain't summer camp and this isn't the playground in a preschool. These are people who have no problem invalidating and hurting other people. And when they're enabled by other people through these throwaway statements like they didn't mean it, it makes it hurt even more and it fuels our sense of doubt and confusion. So that's one example of the kind of thing a narcissistic enabler says more of these are coming, and if you have any ideas, please drop them in the comments.
Wake, wake, wake up out of your sleep. Wake up. Wake up out of your sleep. Wake up, I command you in the name of Jesus. Wake up. Wake up out of your sleep. Wake up. Wake up out of your sleep. The Lord told me to tell you, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Stop crying and wake up. Stop worrying and wake up. Stop fretting and wake up. God's getting ready to get ready to get ready to get ready. ready. Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! In the balcony! Wake up! In the cross then! Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! Wake 